Welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ellen Wilson, and I'll be the moderator for this expert briefing for the media, which is hosted by the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. As we prepare for possible fall and winter COVID-19 surges and what might be a strong flu season, today's briefing will address a number of public health topics, including the impact of the CDC's relaxed COVID-19 guidance and bivalent COVID boosters. The experts will also provide updates on the continuing spread of monkeypox and how people can protect themselves. Please note that participants are welcome to use images, video, or quotes directly from the briefing, and that the content is for immediate release. First, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. Carrie Althoff is an associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. During the pandemic, Professor Althoff has been engaged in research initiating large-scale cohorts of people with and without COVID, and seroprevalence of SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. She has also been focused on translating evidence and safety guidance for families, including a framework for decision-making incorporating the risks and benefits of travel and family gatherings. Dr. Andrew Pekosh is a virologist professor and vice chair of the Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology at the Bloomberg School and co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center of Excellence for Influenza Research and Response. Professor Pekosh is an expert on viruses with a focus on viruses like influenza, SARS-CoV-2, and other respiratory viruses. He has been studying SARS-CoV-2 variants to understand how they have changed to become more efficient at infecting humans and evading human immune responses. We will have time for questions following our speaker's remarks. The procedure will be as follows. We will take some questions that have been submitted in advance of the briefing and some from the Zoom chat. If you have a question during the briefing, you can enter it in the Zoom chat addressed to all panelists. Please enter your name, media outlet, and question, and we hope to cover as many as possible. Just a note that participants will be muted during this briefing and it will be recorded. Dr. Althoff, please go ahead. Thank you. As the CDC recommendations continue to evolve to focus on protecting our most vulnerable for severe COVID-19 illness, it's time once again to review you and your family's risk tolerance and chosen mitigation strategies. Because there is no longer a recommendation for quarantining if exposed, it is likely the probability of encountering someone with COVID-19 in your community will increase above what it was prior to the relaxing of this recommendation. So if you see COVID-19 cases increase in your child's classroom, consider masking until the number of cases decreases. Five days of isolation is still recommended for a child who is ill. That's five days of missed school. If you're visiting a loved one who is at risk for severe COVID-19 illness, for example, someone of older age or with immune suppression, consider reducing your exposures, masking up and rapid testing immediately before your visit to reduce the likelihood that you bring COVID to your loved one. If you are going to an indoor space with lots of other people, layer up the mitigation strategy so you don't bring COVID-19 home to your family and friends. Get up to date with your vaccination status to prevent severe COVID-19 illness. Now, the bivalent COVID-19 boosters have been approved and are available for people 12 and older. Ultimately, over 160 million doses will be available free of charge. So contact your clinician, your neighborhood pharmacy, your local health department to learn more about how you can access this important bivalent vaccine. Using the same mRNA technology, the bivalent vaccine includes the recipe for the spike protein on the original or ancestral strain of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, as well as the recipe for the spike protein of the Omicron strains BA4, BA5. Once your body produces these proteins, your immune system kicks into gear to mount a response. The goal with the bivalent vaccine is to prime your immune system so it is ready to respond quickly if you become infected with COVID-19 this fall. By prompting this immune response to both the ancestral strain and the BA4, BA5 Omicron lineage of the virus, it is anticipated that folks will have broader protection from severe illness with the current predominantly, the current predominant strains that are circulating. 
Omicron variants are very infectious and they've been dominating for many months. So this bivalent formula is very important for protection against circulating strains this fall. For parents of kids 12 and under, it's important that your kids are vaccinated to keep them healthy and in school this year. The bivalent vaccine still needs separate tests and trials for younger children, that is those 12 and under, before it is approved for use in this age group. So the best thing parents can do of these younger, for these younger children is to ensure they are vaccinated and boosted with the vaccines approved for your child based on their age. Monkeypox. Monkeypox continues to circulate and we are seeing infections in populations outside of men who have sex with men, which is the population that has been disproportionately impacted by monkeypox to date. So monkeypox cases in daycare centers will occur due to that really close contact of the care provider and these young children. So ask your daycare providers for their monkeypox protocols to ensure they are on the lookout for cases and have a response plan that's poised for action. Ask your daycare center for their process for keeping comfort items like small blankets or loveys separate from other children's items. Monkeypox will also likely spread on college campuses via close personal contact. Precautions can be taken to reduce your skin-to-skin -skin contact and close prolonged respiratory contact with others. Definitely consult the student health clinic on your campus for testing information. And as we watch these infectious diseases and acknowledging that influenza will also be circulating over the fall and winter months, remember all of the mitigation strategies that you can layer up or down as the transmission changes during the upcoming months so that you can best protect yourself, your family, and your community. Andy? Thank you, Dr. Alchoff. Now we'll hear from Dr. Pekosh. Dr. Pekosh, please go ahead. Thanks very much. I'll emphasize that bivalent boosters will better prepare us for the expected fall winter surges of COVID-19 for two reasons. The vaccination will provide more protection against current circulating Omicron variants because one of its two components is the BA.5 spike protein, and that variant is the dominant variant circulating in the U.S. today. It will also boost the immunity to other variants because its other component is the original vaccine strain spike. So we will get broader and stronger protection that covers more variants with this booster. This booster following either vaccination or infection provides that same broad immunity. So even if you've been infected in the past year, you should still get your bivalent booster. Bivalent boosters need to be used widely if they are to be effective at helping to limit the emergence of new variants. The more people with high immunity we get, the less likely that variants that escape immunity will be selected for. Now the BA.4 and the BA.5 variants are still the ones that dominate here in the United States. Um, it's important to note there will always be new variants of SARS-CoV-2 emerging. Viruses mutate, that is what they do. The vaccination strategy though is not going to chase variants, but is really focused on the best way to get strong immunity to as many variants as possible. Potential new variants of concern BA.4.6 and BA.2.75 have mutations that allow them to escape some vaccine-induced immunity, but they are not the dominant variants and they will be recognized by the immunity induced by the bivalent booster. We expect to see an increase in COVID cases this fall as people do more activities indoors. But in the absence of a new extremely different variant emerging, we believe that surge will be moderate. Now, when it comes to influenza, we also have some concerns about a fall winter surge this year. Australia and other countries in the Southern Hemisphere had a rough influenza season. It was Australia's worst flu season in five years, and it came earlier than any other influenza season with the exception of the 2009 pandemic. This poses a risk, especially to young children who may not have had much, if any, previous exposure to influenza viruses, prior to this season because of the pandemic precautions that were put in place, the masking, the social distancing. The under 18 years of age population was particularly hard hit in Australia this past year. 
if the U.S. flu season does come early, it may overlap with an expected COVID-19 fall surge, thus providing a lot of problems in terms of identifying who's sick and what virus they're infected with. The simple solution here is get your influenza vaccine to help limit cases and reduce severe disease. This is particularly true in high risk groups because many groups that are susceptible to severe COVID are also susceptible to severe influenza. Finally, with monkeypox, um, the evolution of monkeypox is, is very much different from what we see with SARS-CoV-2 or with influenza. Monkeypox is in the same family of viruses that smallpox is in, but it is a very different virus. Its spread between humans is much less efficient, and monkeypox mutates at a much slower rate than viruses like influenza and SARS-CoV-2. So we're not as concerned about the virus adapting more to humans, but honestly, anytime a virus gets a chance to infect and transmit in a new host, we do run the risk of the virus adapting to be better at infecting that host. So continued efforts to identify and contain monkeypox should work, especially in combination with vaccinating any of at risk of, of at high risk populations. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Pekash. Now we'll take questions. If you have a question, just to repeat, please enter it in the Zoom chat with your name, media outlet question, and to whom you'd like to address your question. So here's the first question from Daniel Payne at Politico for Dr. Altoff. How much of the population will actually get this, be eligible for the bivalent vaccine? And therefore, how much of a difference will it make for the winner? It's an important question. According to the CDC's vaccine tracker information, 51% of Americans who are fully vaccinated are eligible for this bivalent as a first booster dose, and 59% of Americans age 65 and older are eligible for this as a second booster. If these eligible Americans choose to be boosted with bivalent vaccine this fall, it will not only reduce their personal risk for severe illness, but it's also going to bump the population level immunity, protecting our communities and providing greater protection for those at greatest risk for severe illness. All individuals who are vulnerable to severe COVID-19 are eligible for this bivalent vaccine. Please consider it. Um, and if we all work together, we're going to see the greatest impact of this bivalent vaccine. Great. Thank you. Here's a question from Johanna Alonso at the Daily Record for Dr. Pekash. What are states and local jurisdictions doing, or what should states be doing, to prepare to start rolling out these boosters? Will this rollout more resemble the rollout of the original vaccines back in late 2020 or of the previous booster? Great, great and important question. The rollout will probably be much more similar to what we saw with the boosters, meaning that places like pharmacies and healthcare clinics and individual healthcare providers will be the best places for individuals to get their boosters. Um, there may be a little bit of a shortage initially because the vaccine is now just being rolled out across the country, uh, but certainly those are the easiest places for individuals to contact, check for availability for the boosters, and make an appointment to get them. Great, thank you. Here's a question for you, Dr. Pekosh, from Julie Steenhausen at Reuters. How likely is it that an annual booster policy will be adequate? Uh, it, you know, it's a difficult question to ask. Uh, we know that this bivalent booster this year will work against the strains that are circulating, so that's clear. Whether we turn this into an annual booster the way we do it with influenza is still something that's under discussion. Um, it is being seriously discussed. We do know that immunity from these vaccines wanes over time, so there may need, need to be an annual booster, but it's not clear whether that's going to be limited to at-risk populations or to the general public yet. We really want to focus on rolling out this bivalent booster this fall and then use that data to think about how the strategy can be uh, better formulated going forward. Great, thank you. Here's a question from Alex Ruoff at Bloomberg for Dr. Pekosh or Dr. Altoff. Do you see the shift to commercializing COVID vaccines as impacting booster uptake in the months to come? 
So I can I can start with that. So the Biden administration bought 66 million doses of Moderna's bivalent vaccine and 150 million doses of Pfizer's bivalent booster. These vaccines will be made available without charge to the American people. And additional doses can be purchased by the federal government, but it will likely require additional funding from Congress to do so. So I think the answer to that question has yet to be seen, but it's important to note that right now, there is bivalent vaccine that is both available and in the pipeline um, that is available free of charge. Great. And another follow-up for you, Dr. Pekosh. Are you seeing any change in vaccination rates among the uninsured since the federal programs to pay for vaccines for the uninsured ended? Well, for the short term, this shouldn't affect uptake of the bivalent booster in those populations. Um, but I do mirror what uh, Dr. Althoff has said. Going forward, this strategy of vaccination, testing, and then treatment with antivirals is the best way we have of minimizing severe COVID-19 disease. Um, that has been supported by much federal funding. As that goes away, uh, the ability of people to take advantage of that uh, may be compromised. So it's an important question that we need to address either through additional federal funding or through alternative ways to funding that because we don't want the cost of these vaccinations, testings, and treatments to really limit the uptake of those, particularly in the vulnerable populations. Great, thank you. Here's a question from Alex Martichu at Nexstar Media. Given what we've seen in Australia, would you recommend people get the flu vaccine earlier than normal in the U.S.? How would you suggest people thinking about the right timing for the flu vaccine, Dr. Pekosh? It's always difficult to time vaccinations correctly. Um, what I would do is, this, particularly if you're in a high-risk group, um, I would uh, see about influenza vaccine availability in your area. Um, the vaccine usually rolls out primarily in October. There may be some pharmacies that have it right now. But I would think about the influenza vaccine in the same way you're thinking about the bivalent COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, both of those are needed. Both of those should be scheduled as soon as possible and ideally at the same time so that uh, one doesn't fall into the trap of getting one and then just forgetting to get back for the other. Great. And moving back to COVID, for you, Dr. Altoff, from Tina Say at Science News, it seems we're asking the vaccines to do a lot of work. Why is there less emphasis on masking, testing, and isolation, and on improving indoor air quality? So let's be clear that there is still um, a lot of focus on these other aspects. I think the reason why we're focused on vaccine right now is because of this recent approval of the bivalent vaccine. It is, um, you know, a little bit of an added bonus to have a bivalent va vaccine available. But just as you're, you, you made it, this point in your question, having structural interventions in place, such as improved ventilation, not just good for COVID, but definitely probably going to help reduce influenza transmission, as well as better indoor air quality in general, can uh, reduce the likelihood of a lot of different, um, both infectious and chronic diseases. So all of these um, different aspects of, of it, mitigation strategies are still on the table. Um, and there is a level of uh, personal responsibility that's also at play here. You can wear a mask wherever and whenever you want. You can decide on the quality of your mask for both fit and, and um, the, the filtration level. And all of these things can come together based on your uh, risk strategy, your risk tolerance with your family members and your household members, and what you have coming up in the near future in your life, for example, visiting an older loved one. Um, so I think it's really important to note that although vaccination strategies are really at the front of our minds right now with the rollout of the bivalent vaccine, yes, there are so many other tools in this toolbox that we can reach for. Great. And another question for you, Dr. Altoff. Emily Pollan at AARP states, nursing homes have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and also tend to experience similar devastation during severe flu seasons. How do we protect this vulnerable population given the relaxed COVID-19 guidance, slow COVID-19 booster uptake and possible viral surges during the upcoming winter? 
This is an excellent question. And I think you have to look at um, three different groups to answer this question effectively. First of all, the residents themselves, the people we are trying to protect. Um, I am hopeful that many nursing home uh, residents have been given access to the vaccine. We know we've seen that because it is so powerful in preventing the most severe illness in these older adults, including death. Um, we also have to think carefully, and you can ask the nursing home that your loved one may stay in, about what their policies are for their staff in terms of their vaccination policies. And then finally, what is our role as individuals who go into those nursing homes and seek our, our loved one's company, which is a very important thing to do. So making sure that you do uh, reduce your exposures in the week leading up to that visit. Make sure you have tested, do a rapid test at home before you go in and see someone. And if you're if you're um, still a little bit concerned about, well, I did go into work three times this week, or I've been to the grocery store twice, you can wear a mask with your loved one and still have um, a face-to-face -face visit. So there are a lot of strategies. Um, each group, the, the residents, the, the staff there to care for them, and uh, the family members and friends who go to visit all have a role to play. Great, thank you. And for you, Dr. Pekosh, a question from Meredith Cohn at the Baltimore Sun. The recommendation is to get the new booster after two months from the previous shot. Is that good timing? What should be considered? Well, it's important to note that this booster, this bivalent booster, is essentially replacing all the boosters that uh, advice that we were given previously. Um, boosters are most effective when there's some time space between your initial either vaccination or infection and the time that the boosters are given. So two to three months is a good starting point. Um, many immunologists would say that even extending that out to as much as six months would be good to stimulate those memory responses, those responses that are going to be there, be prepared and ready to respond to you when you, uh, when you are ready to respond when you are getting infected. So Two to three months would probably be the minimum that I would suggest, but anywhere up to four to six months would also be a good timing between your previous exposure and uh, your taking of the booster. Great, thank you. Here's a question for both panelists. From Ariel Dreher at Axios. How at risk are children and teens going back to school right now for both COVID-19 and influenza? And what can families do to protect their kids with few mitigation measures in place in classrooms? Let's start with you, Dr. Altov. So I, I am a parent of three children who did return to uh, in-person education this fall uh, in schools where masking is not required. It is a choice. And uh, I do see the increased ventilation systems and even just, you know, circulating air, which I know a lot of schools have put into place. The best thing you can do to get your child ready to stay healthy and in school is to get them fully vaccinated and boosted if they're eligible, as well as ensuring that they have the influenza vaccine this fall. Um, it is a lot as a parent of three kids, and I can't take them all at once because then they all scream together. I know this pain, but it is really important to keep your child healthy and in, and in school. And I think that the thing that we have to remember is that when we have a child out of school, it's hard on that child. Um, a lot of school systems don't have a virtual option running in parallel this year for kids who go out for five days at a time. And five days is a long time when we're talking about school age children. In addition, um, we have to remember that a parent usually then has to be home. And so we have both the what it means for the child and their education, but also the parent. So making sure your kids are vaccinated and boosting, layering up if you get the letter sent home, you know, by email, if there's been a confirmed case in the school, your child has been close to it or it's been in this classroom, you know, think about what that means, particularly if grandma and grandpa are coming to visit that weekend in terms of just, hey, let's pop on a mask for the rest of this week. And Dr. Pekosh, anything to add? Yeah, I, you know, I think we've been fortunate that both COVID uh, and influenza, for the most part, are not as dangerous to younger children as they are to the elderly, but that doesn't mean that they don't pose a risk. Um, there are plenty of severe cases of both influenza and COVID that happen in younger populations, 
and younger populations tend to be the vehicles to spread those to other individuals as well. So having a good discussion with your family members about how they're feeling, making sure that there's honest and open discussions about if someone isn't feeling well, um, letting people know about that, and having that testing uh, in place to be able to determine if someone is in fact infected with flu or COVID-19 is another thing that can be done at the individual's level or at the family level. A little preparation ahead of time can help you address the question when someone comes home starting to sneeze or cough to figure out what's going on there and what they're actually infected with. Great, thank you. And for you, Dr. Pekosh, a question from Claire Bugas from Very Well Health. What side effects can people expect to experience from the BA.4, BA.5 bivalent booster? Do we have any data beyond what Moderna and Pfizer presented from their BA.1 bivalent vaccine clinical trials? Yeah, that's the data we're relying on right now. And all of the side effects from the bivalent booster were very similar to what we saw with the regular booster, and even going back to the initial vaccination. So nothing different in terms of the side effects that are being reported. Most often it's redness at the site of inoculation, uh, some soreness, uh, feeling tired for a day or two often afterwards. All the same side effects um, were seen at relatively the same rates with the bivalent booster. Great, thank you. For you, Dr. Althoff from Aaron Pratter at Fortune Magazine. Do you expect to see monkeypox outbreaks in elementary and or high schools? Is there any evidence that the virus has taken hold in another community aside from the men having sex with men community? So we know that the, the virus uh, spreads through its uh, transmission modes and it, it does not matter, you know, who is, is in, in that transmission mode. It just matters that that mode is occurring, right? So yes, I do expect to see um, some monkeypox. I think it'll be hopefully very low as Dr. Pekash pointed out. It is not as efficiently transmitted as smallpox. It's far less efficiently transmitted as COVID. So it's not going to be um, likely to be a big outbreak like that. But we have to remember that kids, um, particularly in daycare seminars, but even you know, some of our smaller kindergartners and first graders, there is a lot of person-to-person -person contact with those kids. So it's just making sure that we are on the lookout, right? We are on the lookout for signs and signals of monkeypox. Um, I definitely think we will also see it um, on college campuses. I think that there are other communities I know right now where we have heads up and we're looking carefully among pregnant women, um, other populations that we know we can see through um, their accessing care, for example, when you're pregnant. So there are different places that we're continuing to monitor. Um, whether or not it will take hold, or um, maybe a better way to say that is disproportionately impact a population the way it has among men who have sex with men um, is still unclear, but we do not expect it to stay. And we have seen it already spread outside of the men who have sex with com men community and into other communities. Great, and if thank I, you. Oh, go ahead, can, Dr. Pekash. Yeah, just add one thing. It's, it's good here to note that in Western and Central Africa, where monkeypox has been more um, indigenous, um, there are many, many cases, if not the majority of cases, of spread among family members and in, in, com in communities. Um, so it's possible to spread this virus in those situations. We need to, as Dr. Altov mentioned, we need to raise the awareness to make sure that uh, people understand these, can identify cases, and prevent it from becoming uh, uh, something that's spreading uh, in other scenarios like among families or in daycare centers and those kind of places. Great, thank you. And for you, Dr. Pekash from Rebecca Corey with Yahoo News, back to flu. Based on what we've seen in the Southern Hemisphere this year, what could a strong flu season in the U.S. look like? Should we expect more hospitalizations and more severe symptoms than in previous years? Yeah, the first thing that we'll look for is when local public health agencies start to report cases of influenza. We shouldn't see influenza until November, December at the earliest, and it shouldn't peak until January to February or so. So if we start to see significant case numbers in October or September or November, that'll be the first sign that influenza is coming here earlier. Um, and then 
The vaccines this year should be a good match. So um, we would expect to see those cases occurring in a variety of different populations right around the same time, but we'd particularly be looking at individuals coming to hospitals uh, who are testing positive for influenza and understanding what their makeup is. Are they over 65, the more vulnerable populations, or do those ages range to younger ages, which would again tell us that we're maybe expecting a more severe influenza season. So the timing and then the makeup of the individuals who are coming into hospitals with influenza are the two critical things that we'll be monitoring for the, particularly the early months. Speaking of maybe, hospitals, um, oh, go ahead, Dr. Altov. Maybe just to add to that, you know, the other end of the age spectrum is also where we'll be looking for severity of illness, as Dr. Pekash pointed out in his opening. You know, there are a lot of small children who have not had a lot of exposure to influenza for the past few years. And so we are going to be paying close attention to what we see uh, amongst uh, children in terms of both numbers of influenza and severity of disease. Great. And a follow up from Meg. Wingarden at the Denver Post. How much concern is there about healthcare capacity given staffing losses and the possibility of a bad flu season? We could start with you, Dr. Pekash. Yeah, that's always a concern. Um, we certainly know that uh, we've learned a lot about managing cases through the COVID-19 pandemic. So certainly there's an awareness of what um, emergency rooms and other places, uh, other healthcare providers need to do to deal with these surges. But it is a big unknown. And the sooner we sort of have an inkling of whether or not there is a larger surge of flu cases, the better off we'll be in terms of being able to prepare our healthcare system for dealing with these cases. And for either panelist, a question from Lindsay Smith Rogers Are MPX vaccines available for kids, pregnant women? The vaccines are really limited to, to, to healthy adults. Um, there's been very little testing of this vaccine in populations outside of healthy adults. So there won't probably be a recommendation to get vaccination in those populations unless there's really extenuating circumstances. There, there has been some testing of vaccines in immunocompromised individuals. The, the monkeypox vaccine has a, had a couple of trials, and that was um, predominantly uh, motivated by what was being seen in Africa with this, this uh, surgence of monkeypox among MSM that then disseminated into communities. Um, and it does look like those uh, that those safety data were, were compelling. It looked like it could be used, but specific to pregnant women and to children, um, there are a lot of questions there. And, and right now, um, I think it would be a, a very uh, rare cases where that would be uh, a choice. Okay, thank you. Here's the last question for both panelists from Kyle Peppers at WBBJ in Tennessee. What are the biggest differences today versus two years ago when it comes to fighting the spread of COVID-19? Let's start with you, Dr. Altoff. So I think it's really important to know. I mean, as a scientist, I think it is overwhelming, the amount of knowledge and the tools that we have accumulated in just two years. Uh, it, it has felt like a lot longer for many, many days the last two years. Uh, but really, we have accumulated incredible knowledge. We know uh, what transmission is all about with uh, COVID. We understand how to treat COVID better. We know how to prevent uh, illness by, by layering up a, a broad range of mitigation strategies. So we have more tools. We have more knowledge. And I think the other thing to recognize is that the um, the public has been right there through all of this science. You have watched it play out in real time. You have been asked to make uh, challenging choices. And so I think it's important to recognize that as we continue to move forward, the knowledge may continue to evolve. The, the toolbox of mitigation strategies is strong and we know how to protect ourselves, our families and our communities. Yeah, it, 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 it is such a simple formula now vaccines, testings, antivirals, um, all of those things were not part of our arsenal two years ago and are now there. And, you know, knowing how to use those effectively is really the critical thing. But I think um, we're in a position now where everybody has access to those. And 
we can if we can utilize them effectively, that's our path forward to returning to pre-pandemic life because we have the tools now to deal with infections with severe disease and we can now sort of not rely as much on those other interventions but realize that all of those things are there to help us uh, to deal with this so it's really about effective use and engagement with these strategies to help us control the severe disease caused by COVID-19 and I'll add influenza. Great. Thank you to both of you for your presentations and insightful answers. And with that, I'd like to say thank you again to everyone for joining us today.